You're listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and how to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk. And now, enjoy Factual America with our host, Matthew Sherwood. Welcome to Factual America, a podcast that explores the themes that make America unique through the lens of documentary filmmaking. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and every two weeks it is my pleasure to interview documentary filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Uh, We're coming to you this time uh, from uh, York, England, uh, Factual America Studio in Exile, also known in the Sherwood household as The Kitchen. Um, It's it's the lockdown version. It's our first lockdown podcast. And with that in mind, um, I want to, instead of jumping to the topic, I want to bring our guest in straight away because uh, in times like these, it's it's good to find out how people are doing. So let me, uh, without further ado... Uh, ask Norman Stone to say hello. How are you doing, Norman? I'm doing fine. I I think you've got a lovely kitchen. Um, I'm personally in my home office up here in Scotland, um, just north of Glasgow. Well, it looks like a great man cave to me, but... uh, Don't tell the wife, (laughs) but it's true. It's true. Well, thanks to the wife, that's why this kitchen's uh, passable. I had to paint it last week, so, uh, so it's a fresh coat of paint. Um, a nice, nice white, off-white uh, background, so we, we should be okay for those of you uh, actually watching and not just listening to this. So um, welcome uh, to Home Decorating Tips, brought to you by... <laughs> exactly. Hey, those guys get a lot of views. I, I, I know. I've, I've, I've watched a few. Um, but, uh, hey, let me just, at this point, before we go even get to the topic, um, Norman, I, for those of you don't know, uh, who don't know you, you're... Um, you're an award-winning director, producer, and screenwriter. Writer. You've uh, won two BAFTAs, and I think twice have gotten an international Emmy. Um, I'm not even going to start to try to go down your filmography. Uh, well, it's going to be in the show notes, and it wouldn't do you justice. Uh, I know you rose to fame with uh, the uh, TV uh, drama of uh, Shadowlands, and have just been. It's been pretty much onwards and upwards from there. Um, and I've noted that you've directed people like Claire Bloom, Peter O'Toole, Jonathan Price, Dirk Bogard, Lee Remick, Helena Bonham Carter, Jeremy Irons. Um, you must have some t- stories you could tell. Oh, so many, you wouldn't believe. I'm not sure I'm allowed to tell every one of them, but yes. Basically, they're great people, you know. Um, I, I was a bit in awe of stars at first, and then you realize they're just like you. They're just trying to do their best. And once you get on the same line with them, um, uh, and you care about the film together, then I've had very good experiences with these people. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I think we're going to have to save some of those conversations for another uh, another podcast. But I think just just O'Toole alone could probably fill several podcasts. Uh, but uh, he would have agreed with you entirely. <laughs> I was going to say I've, I have I have drunk I had a drink with Peter O'Toole but that's really uh, stretching the you, you, you said drunk that. I noticed the slip of tongue you said I had a drunk well, yes, at a certain points in his time, life that would have been quite understandable he, he dried that out was, by the end it was probably more in reference to myself at the time but uh, I think it's um, um, it's it's a bit of a stretch of the definition of the preposition with I uh, happen to be in the same pub uh, he frequented the Red Lion just off German Street. I forget what the oh, yeah. time road is, but uh, I uh, was in there one time and looked over, and at the other end of the bar was Sir Peter O'Toole. So uh, there you go. Uh, one of my claims to yes, fame. He talked right? about that with me often. He said, there was once a chap at the other end of the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Who was making a fool of himself. American guy, <laughs> Yank. Um, but anyway, uh, so but it's not just dramas. You've done um, you, a lot of documentaries. That's how you cut your teeth, I, I gather. And you, a lot of dramatized uh, docs, C.S. Lewis, uh, Florence Nightingale, uh, even the King James Bible has been a subject. Um, so I think that brings us nicely, I, th- uh, I believe, to the uh, sort of the subject of, the, of today's um, uh, uh, podcast, because you've just 
just put in the can uh, a, a film called The Final Fix, uh, which is launching in May and narrated by Ewan McGregor. And uh, that brings us nicely to the topic, I think, of today's podcast, which uh, is an unfortunate topic, but one I think that deserves uh, a lot of more attention than it's been getting. And uh, that's opioid addiction. Yeah. Um, now, uh, let just to f- set the scene, and then I'm going to quickly switch over to you, as I should, as any good host should. Um, even the National Institutes of Health in the United States have uh, described it as a serious national crisis that affects public health as well as social and economic welfare. Uh, 128 people die every day. That's uh, around 47,000 people per year in the United States die from um, opioid overdosing overdoses. Uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which is obviously in the news a lot these days with the uh, coronavirus, uh, has estimated that the economic burden of the crisis um, is uh, of prescription opioid misuse alone is $78.5 billion a year in the U.S. And that includes the cost of health care, lost productivity, addiction treatment, criminal justice, and involvement. Uh, in criminal justice involvement. So I could update those figures for you, by the way. They are modest figures. Well, according to the American government's figures, the cost over the last uh, two or three years to the economy in America has been $2.5 trillion, which is bizarre to me. There's regularly, uh, I mean, back in 2017, I think it was where where the figures come in, uh, there was at least 72,000 deaths in America, which is higher. Uh, And there's just endless, endless uh, trouble because 2 million people in America have to... uh, have to get up in the morning and take a fix. That's two million. I mean, the, 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 again, the government figures say on this issue that you have a uh, amount of people uh, who have been affected, oh, how do they put it, negatively and powerfully by the addiction crisis. There's 46% of American population that has been affected by, in that way by this crisis. That means over 151 million people need to think about this, want to think about this because they've been damaged by it. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, even in the context of the numbers we're talking about now with this uh, pandemic that's going on. And the, the figures you mentioned are even bigger than this crazy uh, stimulus package that's come out recently in the States to try to address this one issue. I, I think, well, maybe later in the in the podcast, we can talk about how maybe things are going to look different uh, in the next uh, in the coming years, but uh, these are amazing numbers. And uh, what I find as, as an American, as someone who's been, a, you know, it's one of these things we're all aware of. You hear opioid crisis, that gets, you know, you, you start ticking down the list of things that uh, need to be addressed. That's always towards the top. But that seems to me often where it kind of stops. People are aware it's happening. Uh, we can get into the discussion later about why there's sort of a lack of action, if you will, uh, on this. But um, before we do that, as, we, as you know how we roll here at uh, Factual America, we've asked you to choose a film that, um, well, to, that helps serve as a backdrop to this subject and one that I think is uh, near and dear to your heart. So um, that would be Warning This Drug May Kill You. So can you... Uh, Maybe it's directed by Perry Peltz uh, for HBO. Uh, so why did you choose this film, Norman? Um, I was preparing for another film, and I was on a plane <clears throat> going across to America, and on those fearsome little screens, um, I saw an option of um, of the film called Warning This Drug May Kill You, which is an impressive title, but also I was interested in that particular subject anyhow, and I watched it. And frankly, it just blew me away. Uh, it was incredibly well made, incredibly powerful. Uh, someone had obviously crafted it well, but with passion. And it wasn't afraid of story and emotion. You see, I don't think that, well, for me at least, documentaries are not meant to be illustrated lectures. You know, slideshows on science by a man in a white coat doesn't work for me. Um, you've got to tell human stories and you've got to be interested in stories and people with all that that means, with respect and relentless truth, that's got to be at the centre. 
and powerful emotion. And that came into a subject that could have been mistreated so easily uh, and she did not mistreat it. And it was very, very powerful. The only problem at the end um, was after a tremendously um, powerful way of making the film and constructing it and structuring it and so on, at the end, you almost felt like slitting your wrists because there was no hope left. You saw people... She dissected the problem with these people going worse and worse and dying and so on, but brilliantly so. And then she said, well, um, if you want to know where your nearest rehab is, of course, they'll put you on another drug. Um, then uh, we ask SAMHSA, which is an organization in America, as you know, uh, a medical yeah. one. Um, and then that was it. So I understood it. I felt the power of it. I didn't have anywhere to go, except I knew of something that maybe did have somewhere to go and I think you're going to ask me about that later so stay tuned yeah, I, th I think we might get to that point I guess I think actually to draw on your your wealth of experience it also might be good at this stage to let's talk about this film specifically um, besides the subject matter uh, as you've already alluded to it, it's extremely well crafted and there's and there's even a scene well there's the opening that we're not going to show because as, as we've discussed previously, it's very powerful. And anyone who hasn't had a chance to see it, I highly recommend you watch this. Uh, but the first two minutes are just some of the most powerful cinema I think we've, I've seen in, in recent, recent years yet. Um, so what is it about what Perry, she's, she's, a, she's a journalist by back, broadcast journalist by background. So what was it that she did that, uh, that's very, that, that really gets that story across? She went after truth. And she didn't blink. Um, I think that's a high accolade for a filmmaker. Um, I've talked with her on the phone since. She's helped me on a, a film that I've been making. Um, and I haven't I really studied her enough. I know she gives talks on film structure and so on. I've seen them online. Um, but I think she's a journalist with heart, a total commitment to truth, and, understand, and understands filmmaking in a way that keeps you watching. Do you know, as documentary filmmakers and indeed drama, drama film directors, you have to earn the right to be heard. I think that's the phrase I would plump on. You have to earn the right. No one, no one owes me a viewing. No one, just because I'm interested in it, doesn't mean anyone else should be. So you earn the right to be heard in many ways. And one of the ways is by uh, telling things with a straight eye you do not turn away or fudge you go after truth so that's the the one thing i i uh, apart from the the skills of a filmmaker that's what i really think she's got and long may that continue well i think that's good advice for for even we young filmmakers that are thinking about entering into the into the business what is it that um, what's what's a key element to to success if you will is i guess is 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 this passion that you're talking about a passion, passion. yeah you see, you see skill by itself isn't enough um you can get classic cases of people who are very skillful lenny rickstenstahl or whatever her name was in 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 germany yeah. well, she was doing yeah. propaganda for hitler brilliantly there are still films locked away in vaults that we are not allowed to see because it was such powerful anti-jewish propaganda but she was brilliant. That didn't make it good. That didn't make the, 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 the there was a hollow center. It was based on lies. Whereas you've got to be, you can be committed to truth and make a dreadful film as well. <laughs> so I think the yeah. two things go hand in hand. Well, let's, I mean, maybe even taking a step back. Um, what are opioids? Opioids? Are you, are you needing a tablet right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, probably do. Um, and, um, you know, I guess the 90s, the doctors started prescribing them. And, you know, I don't m mind naming and shaming because it's public record. Purdue Pharma even pleaded guilty in 2007 and paid one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical settlements. Um, and then this will take us to, I think, our, our first clip. But uh, <clears throat> you go back before then to the late 70s and 80s where pain was made king. What do I mean by that? Well, suddenly we were being told by pharmacists and doctors that pain was the important thing. It was even put forward that it would be a vital sign, which later people woke up and said, well, it can't be a vital sign. It's very personal. Some people feel it terribly and some people don't, etc. But they were very keen to have pain be above everything else. Why? Well, you may not believe this, but they had some painkillers that they'd like to sell. 
And they started off on that road telling us that we needed pain was the big thing and then saying, look, we can do this. And Purdue Pharma, since you mentioned them, um, one of the brothers that started it had been high on Madison Avenue in an advertising. He was very clever at that. And they took over an old constipation medicine um, factory uh, outside New York. And they twitched it and switched it round to something that eventually became Oxycontin, um, which was the big opioid push that it did. And they did it with such calculatingly, I can say this now because it's been proved in court, um, calculatingly brazen, money-centred brutality that people deliberately, on their part, started to, uh, to take these tablets. And the doctors were both bribed and encouraged and sweet-talked and given holidays and sometimes just hard cash to actually get people hooked on their product. Well, why would they do that? Because they were the owners of the product. They had it. And I'll give you a quote, which accidentally, I don't know why I sort of committed it to memory. This was from a, f a very early message in the early days of Purdue Pharma, came out in court, and he's talking to his thousands of sales agents that he took on. It went skyrocketing. He said, anticipating what they're about to do and sell all these tablets, uh, as many of them, he said, we will create a blizzard of prescriptions so white and so deep that no one will be able to survive. And if the people come to us and say, you have addicted us and you have made me ill, I think that was the phrase, um, we say to them, you are the criminals, you have abused our good drugs, end quote. And that is like a, com a confession to murder, as far as I'm concerned. Because while they made billions upon billions upon billions of dollars out of this, they killed hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands, with cold-blooded calculation. Of course, they didn't necessarily want to kill them. They wanted them to keep paying for the drugs. And then, like a perfect storm, the pain thing that they'd started, this is the most important, the painkiller thing. And ordinary people, these weren't junkies, as they used to call them, uh, uh, under the freeway or panhandling on the streets. These were good people, your neighbours, maybe yourself. People watching this podcast are going to know someone who's done this. And they're not nasty people. They are just hooked. That's bad enough. But to be hooked deliberately is criminal. Well, and I think that's where this, I think that's where the, uh, the film, Perry Peltz's film, is actually quite, quite uh, striking. And, and I think that a good clip to show right now would be the, um, there's one main, there's several protagonists, unfortunately, many of them, and I don't think it's a spoiler alert, are no longer with us. But uh, the main protagonist is someone named Stephanie Gay. Um, and uh, I think it's I think it's a clip that uh, and maybe you want to set it up, but basically shows how she she talks about how she, she unwittingly went down this slippery slope into uh, into an addiction. Yes, I think she had kidney stones as a teenage girl, and the doctor merrily gave her a tub of I think it was oxycotton uh, of painkillers, and she just went for it. She just got hooked without meaning to. And, th and that's the point. There's a girl, and it's replicated many times across America, and to a point still is being. In those days, with commissions to sell pills and so on, they were widely operated uh, as, as distributors. They were the drug pushers. And I think, I don't think they were wicked doctors necessarily. I think there are wicked people at the core of it. But I think uh, they were doing what made sense to them at this time, and no one knew the disaster that was going to happen. So there's Stephanie. She gets these drugs, and then we see what happens. If somebody told me six years ago that I was going to be a heroin addict, I would have thought that they were crazy. Never in a million years. I didn't hang out with bad kids. I didn't get in trouble. I, I just would have never, ever thought that it could happen to me. When I was about 16, I started getting kidney stones. And they would give me pain medication for it because that's pretty much all that they could do. 
the x-rays would show the kidney stones. There was no faking it, nothing. I mean, here is a child, 15, 16, I, it was about the age she started getting them. Um, and she's getting them every, a few times a year. They gave me a shot of Dilaudid, which is a very strong painkiller. And then I remember them sending me home with a prescription of Oxycontin and a prescription of Vicodin. And I remember thinking at that time, wow, those are kind of high-powered medications for such a young person. But I trusted the doctors. In the beginning, I would just take my Vicodin as prescribed when I was in pain. But it, like, gradually got worse over time. It numbed my feelings and made me feel, like, OK about everything. You know, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. You know, I would take an extra one here or there. And then if I would ran out, I would just pretend like I didn't know what was wrong with me so that I could get more, you know, faking pain to go to the hospital to get painkillers. I mean, it would be anything from Oxycontin to Vicodin to Norco's. Then it went from taking the prescribed dose of like one every six hours to taking like 20 Norco's a day. I'm going through a month prescription in two days. And I called my mom crying, and I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Mom, I can't stop taking these, because when I stop taking them, I don't feel good. I said, well, we need to talk to your doctor. And he wrote me another prescription for Percocets, which was stronger than the Norcos that I had been taking. All right, I think, um, I mean, as, uh, as Norman's been saying, uh, you know, there's a lot of people affected by this and unwittingly have fallen into um, uh, addiction. And I think that's a very good example of this, uh, this woman who was only a teenager, um, started taking, was prescribed the pain medicine and uh, now has fallen into this, uh, this horrible world of, of addiction. Um, I mean, I think, I, I hate to throw numbers out there, they're just numbers, but you know, it's, it's just, even in even the government's own official statistics are, you know, a quarter to a third of patients prescribed opioids have chronic pain, mis, you know, misuse them. Um, you know, you have at least eight to 12 percent somewhere in there develop a, uh, a, a you know, abuse the drugs. Um, an estimated four to six percent um, transition to heroin, you know. Um, eighty percent of people who use heroin first misused prescription opioids. So it's just, um, it's this, it's this horrible, um, horrible. Well, it's, as as I think the film says, and anyone else, uh, I think even the government officially calls it. It's an epidemic. Yes, it is. Um, it was the plague before this one with COVID nineteen, actually, and it hasn't gone away, and it will be back. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it, the frightening thing behind all of that. Of course, it was deliberate and done for the dollar. And I know my dear American friends will. Some of them will justify the fact that everyone has a right to earn a dollar in America, but not if you're killing people. And yeah. there are things that have still not been solved, even after the court cases. Uh, it was a big shakedown, but they're still wanting to make money from these things. You've got to have a different ethic. That's all. Well, and I think I think this gets as you said. I I. I don't blame the doctors. I think, I don't know, there's maybe a different uh, different mindset or um, attitude, certainly in the U.S., towards an attitude towards pain, as it's uh, over the last, as you said, several decades. Um, actually, I think that will probably take us to our next clip pretty, pretty quickly here, because I think um, even after these, what we see in the film is that even after the uh, Purdue Pharma settlement and some of these other things, um, you have doctors still prescribing this medication and in volumes to people who they know are abusing it. Um, yeah. And I, I think it takes us to our, 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 if you don't mind, I think this would be a good place because another thing I wanted to illustrate, I think probably a lot of people in America think it, it's almost, I think it's conflated sometimes with the whole crystal meth problem and it's a poor America, poor Midwestern sort of uh, uh, a problem. But um, there's another character that, um, and I think you were going to talk about how, the, or you know, you've noted to me at least uh, before we even had this uh, podcast about the how creatively the uh, the this one-hour film is structured, 
And so we meet the main protagonist, Stephanie Gay, and then we inter interwoven are some other stories that come in. And there's this young, there's this woman named Wynne Doyle, who is anything but from uh, but poor or Midwestern, um, relatively, uh, uh, I would say, glamorous person who um, who um, actually. Uh, well, I'll let you set the scene. Um, it, it's just the perfect. It's the perfect American dream family. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Exactly. And 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 the, the 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 real punch in the gut that Perry Pelts gives us with this is she has the the story told by the family, and by that I mean teenage children who went through this and ended up having to be sort of guardians of their mum to stop her getting worse, uh, and just the systematic destruction of a loving family described by by teenagers is is a powerful powerful uh, way to do this. Yes, I mean, there was a, a temptation actually just to show the whole segment. Um, uh, because there's, and I, I've, you know, there's not even one, just one little clip that's better than the other of that, of that segment. But I think the one that we've settled on is the one that, um, well, it's, it's not a spoiler alert because I think it's pretty obvious from the get go that uh, Wynn did not succeed in her battle with the uh, uh, addiction. And, um, and you've got the whole scene where the children are there, unfortunately, um, for when she does, uh, she dies. Um, the boys are actually even um, having to try to resuscitate her. But then the, I th the, the kicker really for me is the daughter who, as I, th I think if you noted, who is in some ways the reason she's on the painkillers because she had the cesarean and it was a bad, bad difficult pregnancy had painkillers prescribed. Here she is, that daughter now, as a teenager, only 16 years old, talking about how angry she is at the doctors for giving her mother even more painkillers. So um, what we'll do is we'll watch that clip and then we're gonna go to a break. And then after the break, we'll be back with uh, Norman Stone. When the kids were with her, I was always on edge. Then it really just became about safety. I became this hypervigilant sort of guy. And she was fine, but I knew it wasn't gonna last. It just slowly deteriorated again. I heard from the kids that she was going into the hospital because she had a kidney stone that they had to remove. She had been taking a lot of opiates and once she got to the hospital, they were giving her what a normal person would be getting as a dose when you have pain, but it wasn't near the amount she'd been taking on her own. So there she is in a confined spot for four days going through withdrawals, and it was just getting worse. So she left the hospital, and they gave her a bunch of opiates on the way out. Preston and Harry were staying with their mom like she needed all these pills on the side of her bed. The hospital told me to take these, and I was just like, just please don't overdo this. Like, there's a lot of pills here. Eight bottles filled to the top, and I was like, who gave you all of these? And she said, oh, my doctor did. Like, I'm still in a lot of pain from the kidneys. And then the morning, she was just laying there with her arms spread out, and her eyes were kind of open. We said goodbye and got no response, and we thought that was odd. Preston like pulled out his phone to like take a video to like show our father like what was like going on, and um, I like told him like put down the phone like right now, and he's like why? And I, like I, that was I was like grabbing her foot, and it was just ice cold. And I called 911. They were telling me to do ch chest compressions on her. I was just yelling at Preston to stop, and he was just like said we need to do everything we can, and it was. Uh, I mean that's when I had to call like my father. And it just was surreal. And, and having the conversation with Harry, as I can hear Preston in the background. Mom's dead, like we, we need to do something. He just, he didn't blame me. And I was just like, just get to the city like right now. And then hearing Preston screaming on the other, <laughs> you know, he's, he's um, trying to give her compressions. By the end, at the funeral, there were hardly any of her friends.
When I saw the pills on her bedside table when she had passed, that was probably the most anger I could feel ever because she's been to that hospital easily, like, 50 times. They've seen her there unconscious, had to, like, pump her stomach so many times, and yet she comes in there and they leave her, like, with more. I firmly believe that there are so many people that are being prescribed opiates without any direction or support that have no idea what they're getting into, and then once they can't get out of it, the shame and the, the inability to actually confront it and talk about it with somebody makes it worse because now all of a sudden they're an addict. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases and upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program our guests, and the team behind the production. And now, back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with uh, uh, filmmaker Norman Stone. We've been talking about the opioid uh, epidemic in the United States. And we've just seen a clip uh, from the Perry Peltz film, Warning, This Drug May Kill You. Um, And I think you wanted to say something, Norman, about uh, about what... um, well, something about that clip and also what Perry, um, uh, how, or Perry Peltz's treatment of, of physicians. Yes, I mean, it is a powerful story, as we've said and as we've seen, and, and relentlessly the finger is quite accurately pointed at the, at the stupid doctors. Um, these doctors that went along, sometimes not stupid, sometimes money-making, I admit, but uh, they, the way she treats them is not to swing the camera or the film away from the characters we're dealing with, the people we're ca- caring about, but she just exposes. She doesn't uh, blame the doctors in commentary or anything. She shames them by showing what they're doing. So the case uh, that we've just seen... The um, that lady, um, that mom, that first of all, perfect mom gets prescribed tubs more painkillers when they'd actually, as you know, uh, been pumping her stomach to get rid of the painkillers. Now, you could have made a big thing about that. But Perry stayed on her course. She cared about the people. You don't not blame the doctors, but she doesn't hit you over the head with it. Just as much as I guess, although less so for me, because I really don't like what the pharmaceutical companies have done. Their companies, not people. I think you've got to... The, 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 the blame is at their door. I, it's not always necessary to chase them. But absolutely, if you're going to tell the truth, you've got to show where the blame lies. I mean, that's, that raises an interesting point. Are these doctors... What are these doctors being told? Is it, is, are they just trying to get the problem to go away? And maybe the easiest thing is to give this patient... They patient. get nice holidays... Uh, paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. Sometimes they get money. Sometimes they go slightly rogue, although not that rogue. And they put up, um, uh, I don't know what they still do, but they were putting up uh, pop-up doctor offices. And you'd know they were in town because they'd be queuing around the block and filling the car park, people. And they'd just say, look, don't tell me anything. Just give me 250 bucks and I will give you the tablets. And that, that's drug pushing. But that has been recorded again and again and again. They just turn up, sign the docs, and, and live very well off it. I could name names you don't need to. You just need to read some of the books that have been written recently about this. Uh, and it is astonishingly awful. But that's what the system did. Sometimes they're family doctors. And everyone, I know a doctor who, who is still alive today, deeply regrets this. He bought what he read in the papers. He bought the infomercials set out by Purdue Pharma and others. He said, this is the way to do it. I know pain is a problem. I've been told it is. Therefore, this is what you do. And now he looks back and it's obvious to see the self-blame he feels. Um, And I feel sympathetic for him because his intentions were right but it's no excuse for not knowing that you shouldn't give a tub of pills to people who have just been stomach pumped 32 times over the previous year for that same thing i just i think it was an abrogation of the system a system that was bad so this gets us to the point what is what's being done because obviously people 
plenty of people recognize it's a problem. We've had court cases. Um, government agencies are saying this is an epidemic. Um, yet it rages on. Um, I know the, uh, the number of deaths and and or in overdoses in the last few years has uh, the the rate has actually been increasing. Um, so it it seems like nothing's really being being done about this. Well, that is partly because there isn't really that much to do about it. In Scotland, where I live, they're thinking of giving free drugs to everybody that needs them, which will, I think, exacerbate the situation in a very bad way. It'll end up on the black market and so on. But they would disagree. Uh, in America, you've got the MAT, um, Services Medical Assisted Treatment, which has great intentions, is not popular with the addicts. Um, they want to get off, not be parked on another drug. Uh, methadone has not been the answer. That's part of that. Um, MAT uh, format and yet they're very scared you shouldn't criticise that because people may die. Now if that's all that was in the cupboard I would understand that except I would say Every addict I've met, more or less, there's a handful that, that are in the middle of it and don't want to stop it, uh, don't want to get off. But when you reach that point and you really know you're addicted, you want to get off. And I think you've got to respond to that if there's any hope. And that brings me to the film I was working on when I came across this film, Warning This Drug May Kill You, uh, on that plane. And why it attracted me tremendously was because I'd already started to do probably the biggest film of my life, which has just come out, um, yeah. available on Amazon, uh, pay-per-view. Yeah. But it's it just come out. And uh, I had done a film or two previously in my many, many years as being a director about a treatment that claimed to get you off your drug of addiction, whatever it is, sometimes drugs of addiction, addiction plural, in five to seven days, it used to be seven to ten days, without any serious withdrawals, and no cravings from then on. Now, it sounded great, and what I saw was impressive, but I just assumed that the medical world, world would pick it up and take it. I assumed without three Ps, power, profit, and prestige. That's what I boiled it down to, especially profit in America. Uh, it would rain on a lot of pictures, as we say in Britain. It would disturb the status quo, which is very, very um, successful financially. So I decided to go back to this treatment. It's called NET, Neuroelectric Therapy. It's non-pharmaceutical. It just delivers a little pulse behind the ear, and that's very adjustable. And they've worked on it for many years now, and it's really responsive. But I thought, hang on, I really can't expect people to believe that this works. Let's have a big feature documentary um, that will show it and test it and tell the truth. Thank you, Perry Peltz, whatever it is, however painful it is. And so I set off. I didn't think it was going to take almost two and a half years, which it has. I deliberately didn't get a commission from the BBC or anywhere else because I wanted to make sure I wasn't being pressured by executive producers or anything like that. I wanted the chance to tell the truth, good or bad. And we did it. It's called The Final Fix. And right. it's worth a view because what you will see is what I saw myself with my most truthful hat on and watching and asking to see if there's any cracks in the foundations or problems or something hidden up the sleeves, nothing. It's the most powerful indictment of people in the gatekeeping community of addiction who have turned their backs on this again and again and again because it doesn't fit the system. And hey, did I mention it doesn't use pharmaceuticals? That's a big, big bad mark for some people. Anyway, you should watch it and see for yourself because in actual fact, it works. Simple well, as that. I think uh, I and uh, all our audience will have a chance to watch it. Uh, I know you've had a soft launch and it's on, uh, as you said, uh, on that website run by the world, one of the world's richest men. But uh, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I, I it's going to be on other uh, streaming yeah. platforms as well uh, to be named uh, later. But uh, I mean, I want to go back to this because it's an interesting point you raise. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I might even play a little devil's advocate or... or please or, do, or, please do. The more, you, the more it's questioned, the better. Yeah, the, so, so we know the solution. So we know cold turkey doesn't work, right? People can't just like say one day, I'm going to kick this, 
this addiction to the... Well, some can, but it's very difficult. That's the way that AA works for alcoholics. It, it wow. is possible, but it is very tough. Okay. Um, it's like the way my dad kicked smoking. He did, he did cold turkey, uh, but, and he never understands why others can't do it. But it's, uh, it's, I think there's, sometimes the reformed smokers are the worst. Um, then, there's, then there's the drugs you've already alluded to. The, uh, the, the mat and uh, we've got methadone and there's a whole cocktail of drugs that people try. Um, now, y- you say that's one where the, um, the addicts themselves aren't keen on it because it's addiction to another drug. Is that, is that right? right? That's what they tell me. So um, now if you go to the NIH or in any of these other places, they, they don't obviously they don't mention NET. Uh, right. They mention the drugs uh, therapy, and they draw, talk about uh, better education and less, you know, uh, I guess coming up with alternatives to opioids. But you know, it doesn't help those who are already hooked. Did that persuade? Uh, did that persuade you? No, no. There's nothing about it that that persuade. I have to say, yeah, there's nothing that persuaded me. So, uh, as much as okay, I'm I'm naturally one that's not. To, I have to say into big conspiracy theories and things like that. So, well, if there's something that is out there that does work, why? I mean, why isn't there even been? Has there been any trials, any scientific trials? Yes, trials? there has. Let me give you an example, if you wish, if I can. Um, here in Glasgow, well, in 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 Scotland, uh, where I live. Yeah. Uh, there is one country that is worse than America for drug addictions and overdoses. America's very bad. One country is worse. And I thought, aha, Guatemala, Bolivia, somewhere. It's Scotland. It's Scotland. We pay, and this is pounds, not dollars, nine billion pounds a year in Scotland. It's only got five, five million people in it. Uh, nine billion pounds a year for drug and alcohol uh, treatment. The results from that, the success after 18 months, is 3%. The actual figures that I have seen and watched, debated and agreed with um, behind the scenes on the film with this NET thing, same period, no drugs, five, seven days, Eight, well, let me get this right, 92% success rate, which would be ludicrous. It's ludicrous if you get 9% success rate. So one of the problems may be that it sounds too good to be true. Certainly it did for me, and it certainly does for a lot of my interviewees. There's one lady, Phyllis Platt, who worked for Spalding University, didn't believe it at all. And um, for her study, in not long ago, she took local people, was paid to do the trial to find the data. And with her, it got to 82% success rate, right? 82. And she said, this is amazing. Yes, yes, yes. But she wasn't persuaded. She said, what happens if the 18%, what did, what went wrong there? If you're not meant to have any cravings after it, what went wrong there? So she found them. She went after them, found almost all of them. And not in one case, she said, Uh, was there any connection with cravings why they'd relapsed? The dog had died, the wife had left them, they got depression. It was uh, all the different lists that you could imagine. And I said, what did that do to you? She said, I became, uh, I opened my mind to understand that this is it, This this works. Because if that's the case, it's unheard of in medical history. Now, transport yourself to the top of Harley Street, the doctor's... uh, uh, the highest doctor's street in the land in London or any other high medical profession, you've got a career. You've got a uh, respect. You've got probably clinics and other things in your name. Along comes something that says you don't need that. You don't need that. No medicine. Um, five to seven days, bingo, and no more cravings. You are going to be challenged by that in a number of ways. <clears throat> and I've had doctors run away from the cameras I say, I say literally in one case, uh, and, and put the phone down. I have just come over the years before this. I was interested in it, too, to a degree. Um, and I've seen people not face up to the truth or please challenge the truth. And at the end of this, of the film, after two and a half years, um, what is the great battle cry I, I have in the film? Do you know what it is? It's the very British... 
please could someone look at this? That's all. That's it. How polite is that over a cup of Earl Grey tea? But that's what I'm saying. Just somebody look at it, challenge it robustly, because everything I filmed in the trial seems to suggest we're sitting on the answer and refusing to look because it doesn't fit into the system. And I'm old enough and slightly cynical enough to believe that that's as things are. I mean, I have seen a few, I've, I've, I've been able to have a, a look at a few of the clips from, from, uh, from your film. And I, I did see something where uh, we know the state of Kentucky is especially affected. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of the epicenters and you have uh, policemen and government officials who'd say, yes, let's give this a try. What's we've tried everything else. Nothing's working. Why not? So if you, if you made any inroads there, um, well, the inroad, the first inroad, we, we didn't have a huge budget, but we managed to get a bunch of guys randomly chosen. I had nothing to do with it. I wanted to go straight down the line and see what went on. Um, the ones that uh, completed the trial, one did not. The ones that completed the trial um, came off exactly as they said. I didn't see any uh, examples of cold turkey. I saw them literally bloom as human beings and this is five days five seven days boom they're back bright-eyed bushy tail believing they're superman um and that was over a year ago now when we did that because we made the film from that point um they're still clean they're still happy they're still full human beings one of them went to university came top of his class is now working around the world I keep wishing in a way that I found something wrong because it sounds, you know, it's easily misinterpreted if you're not careful. And if you tell the truth in this instance, it might be an infomercial. Well, it isn't. I tried my best to keep everything neutral, not having hands on, but I was going to be honest. And I have been. Well, and, and one thought that comes to mind is, you know, I know the media is a bit distracted at the moment. Uh, this is, uh, we're in the middle of a, uh, um, April here in uh, 2020 with the, uh, with the coronavirus. But uh, it sounds like something that the New York Times or any of these outlets would be all over. Uh, well, the LA Times is. Um, they're not bringing it out now, but we went and had a meeting with the um, editor there, and I believe they're interested not in the film uh, so much as, right. the, as, the, as the subject. Um, you mentioned NIH. They are very interested in this now. In fact... I believe the head of uh, NIH already had come to the conclusion that if he didn't want to, um, got to be careful not to tell tales out of school, but if he didn't yes. want to just park people on another drug, it must be possible with this steady, uh, steady uh, arrival of electric medicine and AI medicine, it must be possible to stimulate the natural painkillers in the brain, endorphins and enkephalins, which are the lack of which causes cold turkey. He was already at that point, and now talks are ongoing with him, with the NIH, and with NIDA, who are a very powerful and very well-heeled group, uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse. I've met them and talked to them myself. Um, so there are, there are, there, there is real interest, but there's also a huge danger to people's profits and the pharmaceutical companies and other people who bought into this. I'm afraid to tell you that America is not all of milk and honey. Money and corruption are around. And just look at the transcripts of some of the court cases that have been held against Purdue Pharma and many others. It is astonishing what comes out there. And they get 60 lawyers to cover it all over as best they can and move on with still two million, two billion in their pocket. Um, yeah. You know, it, it is it is a all the good stuff and interest and in pushing it forward is pushing uphill with Everest, dragging a dead donkey. As long as these people are concerned, uh, because they do not strange this, they do not wish to lose billions. Well, I think uh, it sounds like a film we should uh, all watch. I think it probably dovetails really nicely with the Perry Peltz film. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, watch that and then. Um, when uh, when this you said it's probably going to launch in May. Um, well, that's the hard launch, I believe. Yes, um, it is. Uh, we've we've allowed it to be on Amazon so people can pay per view and get the get the grassroots interest in it and some early reviews and uh, the rumor mill. 
But the big yeah. press launch and getting it out there uh, on the, the main organs of our communication in society will probably be mid to early May. Uh, that decision is being made uh, very soon, and you'll hear about that. So for those of you listening, uh, this we'll be putting links to appropriate links in the show notes when we when we do release this podcast, and uh, I guess in a matter of a, of a few weeks here. Um, I'm afraid to say I'm, I'm looking at the watch here. I don't have my usual director whispering in, uh, producer in my whispering in my ear to tell me uh, to wrap things up. But I, uh, looking down at the clock down here, I'm, I think we are starting to come very close to running out of time. Uh, didn't even come close to addressing all the things I wanted to talk to you about, Norman. But I, but I'll I, come I, back. I'll come back. I, I will thank you. I, I will take you up on that offer. We don't often get the guests offering to come back, so that's uh, that's really good. Um, I think it's worth uh, just mentioning again that the film we were primarily talking about is uh, Warning, This Drug May Kill You. Uh, came out in 2017, directed by Perry Peltz uh, for HBO. Uh, I want to thank Norman for, for, for being our first lockdown uh, edition guest <laughs> uh, and joining us all the way from, from Bonnie, Scotland. Um, and uh, as you've, we've discussed in the last few minutes, his film's The uh, Final Fix. Uh, narrated by Ewan McGregor, and uh, I guess where, how to follow you, best way of following you, Norman, is it just, uh, do you do social media, or are you uh, just, uh, you have a website? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a website, which is very simple. It's called www.thefinalfix.com. There we go, and we'll put that in the show notes too. Um, I just wanted to say, um, well, big shout out to our listeners as usual. Please get in touch. Let us know what you thought about this episode and ideas for uh, future ones. Uh, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. And this is Factual America signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guest, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.